Hey hey, Marcus House with you here and today I think it is time we talk about rocket engine efficiency and in this episode I'm going to demonstrate some of these principles in a simulation and then compare how that matches with a real life rocket such as the Falcon 9. Luckily for me to demonstrate this, the latest Simple Rockets 2 update has just recently been released. Now, only a few weeks after the Kerbal Space Program 1.7 update, which was very exciting in itself, Jun Drew, who makes Simple Rockets, blindsided us with some spectacular new features which have kind of gone under the radar a little. Until now. Since the release, I've been tinkering with this and I can tell you some of these updates are really amazing, especially because Simple Rockets 2 is of course still in early access. Now the community has been growing and we are seeing some amazing creativity that is really going to make people start to wonder, damn, why haven't I got this game yet? So yes, that is right everyone, you no longer need to be constrained with your choice or scale of rocket engine. Simple Rockets 2 now allows you to completely build and completely customize your own, giving you 8 new engine types, 7 new nozzles and 6 new fuel types. And to add to this, you can actually customize the specifications for the engine, allowing thousands of possible rocket engine configurations. We can even demonstrate exhaust effects, over expansion, under expansion, all kinds of wonderful things. All of the exhaust effects and different fuel types just add even more to this game. You can see the Hydrolox there looks really beautiful, Methalox, all sorts of things we can tinker with here. We have a huge range of engine types we can play with, so really exciting stuff here by the Simple Rockets 2 crew. So what I'm going to do is open up my own little vessel here and we can have a little play with this. You can see here in this example, we have got a range of sliders that let you adjust options for the engine scale uh, or size and the nozzle length, even more hidden settings such as the engine throat radius and even the chamber pressure. Now, I know what you might already be thinking. You're thinking that the majority of people won't know what the heck any of this means, but here's the thing. The engine selection itself from the parts menu is basically just pre-made configurations using all of these settings. So if you simply want a slightly larger or smaller versions of say the Titan engine, that's no problem. You just drag it on, go to the part properties and just ramp up the size settings or whatever you need. So you can tinker with this as much or as little as you want as a new user. Here is possibly the best thing though, not even I could tell you off the top of my head how the nozzle length, chamber pressure and this sort of thing is going to affect an engine's performance. So that is why there is now this very handy performance analyzer panel that we can pop open here. We can drag this around wherever we want. As we adjust the settings in the engine we can actually see exactly how this will affect the specific impulse, the burn time, the thrust to weight ratio of our vessel, you name it. You can see a load of detail here. We can even determine performance differences based on the altitude. Now, obviously, if we were creating a booster stage, we are going to be most concerned about performance between sea level altitudes and altitudes where there is a still quite large amount of atmospheric pressure. If a second stage we're probably more concerned with performance at very high altitudes where there is near or full vacuum. This is all really cool stuff. Now just to quote a little here from the update notes, one of the favorite details of the new engines is how damn good the exhaust looks and that they react realistically to changes in their design and environment, from over-tightened shock diamonds to huge bulbous clouds of supersonic gas. The exhaust really amps up the variety of the already diverse rocket engine aesthetics. So that really hits the nail on the head for me, all that right there. So what I have done is I've made a test stand here with three engines. All these engines are using liquid methane and liquid oxygen, just as an example, and all of the three engines are the same size, they've got the same chamber pressure, but I've configured two of these intentionally badly for sea level, just so that we can demonstrate here how not to configure your engine. Now, although these shock diamonds here look awesome, they are actually a sign of inefficiency. If you're seeing a rocket exhaust like this, you're essentially seeing the exhaust 
over expanded. Now this happens when the pressure of the gases exiting the nozzle is less than the ambient air pressure outside the engine. The higher atmospheric pressure around the engine essentially compresses the gases inwards which also at the same time decreases the velocity of the exhaust. So these shock diamonds are created from the compression which quite substantially raises the temperature and causes the unburned fuel in the exhaust to reignite. That's where the bright spots there of the exhaust are. So yes this kind of issue is generally only seen at low altitudes where the air pressure is high. Now the engine will of course work more efficiently higher up in the atmosphere. The next engine here we have is configured so that the exit pressure of the exhaust almost perfectly matches that of the air pressure at sea level. So this will be more efficient on say a booster stage or something at uh, very low altitudes. Of course it's going to depend how high the booster goes because if it is spending more time at higher altitudes an efficiency drop at sea level may be worth the higher efficiency later on in the launch. Typically though engines will of course be configured to be as efficient as possible throughout the launch profile. So let's take a look at this in a real world example. In the case of a SpaceX Falcon 9, the core booster passes around 9 kilometers in altitude after roughly one minute into the flight. At that point the air pressure is getting close to around one third of that at sea level, so it's getting quite thin at this point. After the first minute the Falcon 9 continues on its burn for around another minute and a half before main engine cutoff and the separation of stage 2. Essentially rocket companies like SpaceX need to calculate the perfect ratios for their engines so they can get as much efficiency from the entire flight profile as possible. For a booster it's extremely important to minimize gravity losses so any added thrust to weight advantage in that first 30 seconds or so is really important. In general most boosters are going to have the engines configured to be as efficient as possible very close to sea level altitudes for this exact reason. Of course it would be difficult to increase the nozzle size of the sea level Merlin engines on the Falcon 9 without making the booster itself much wider in diameter. You've seen the massive difference here between the bell size of the vacuum engine versus the 9 C level Merlins and there's no way they could optimize much more for higher altitudes with the Falcon 9 as it's designed because there's just not enough space at the bottom of that booster to extend the nozzles without them getting in each other's way. As with any decision there's going to be a trade off one way or the other. The thing we know for sure is that the Falcon 9 is certainly a very powerful booster that is running rings around the competition and doing something that no other orbital class booster can do. Yes that is right, landing like a boss. I never get sick of watching these landings, they're just so awesome. So getting back to some other interesting points here, we can have the opposite problem with engine exhaust pressure. If our engine nozzle length is too short, exhaust pressure can suffer from under expansion. Essentially in this case the exhaust gas is screaming out at a much higher pressure than the surrounding atmosphere and this causes the plume to expand outwards which at the same time reduces the efficiency of the thrust. So along with all these settings we can also play here with power cycle types available as well. These are essentially a range of engine configurations and without diving too far into how each individual type differs from any other, the power cycle lets us specify the method of how propellant is fed through the engines, the pumps and essentially how efficient the propellant is burnt. There's a lot of differences in how all these varying engine types are engineered and if you're interested in how many of these differ in more detail I can't recommend Scott Manley's video highly enough which I have linked here in the top right and also in the video description. In this video he gives a great summary of many of these engine types and how the piping, the valves and the burners all work together. So check that out if you want to know a bit more about this whole area. So what else is coming up for Simple Rockets 2? There's actually a huge amount in the pipeline and as we speak it is all evolving very rapidly. They're even planning on releasing the game on mobile devices this year. 
Now this is a bit of a game changer when it comes to the number of devices a game like this can be distributed on. As many of us know, Kerbal Space Program can slow down quite significantly if you create a vessel with many parts. Simple Rockets 2 on the other hand is very very smooth even with thousands of parts. We can see this as I just smash these two incredibly complicated rovers together here. And you can see there that this hasn't been sped up. I haven't sliced out any frame skips or anything like that. It just seems very, very smooth. Another thing I really love is how seriously the developers are taking feedback and implementing features to the game. The community really does influence the direction of the game development by submitting and voting on suggestions. Simply scrolling through the awesome craft library the community has created here is something that's quite amazing in itself and the majority of all of these vessels have been created from just the stock game, no mods at all. Another little bit that I just wanted to share was that just over a week ago, uh, Jundru announced that both Simple Rockets 2 and Simple Planes was going to be available for free for educational purposes. So educators will now have access to download the Windows or Mac versions of the games and install them on any number of classroom computers. So it's a really amazing initiative and I really appreciate what they're doing to help get education out there about the space industry and just inspiring a whole new group of young people to come into the industry and learn about this sort of thing. So if you're interested in the game and you want to know a little more, you might be interested in my previous video linked here in the top right. A massive thank you as always for my very dedicated quality control squad listed here. They're always donating their time to help me read through and research some of these topics, so thank you very much. If you would like to be involved, follow the Discord link in the description of the video. In the tile in the bottom left today, I have for you the Simple Rockets 2 early access video that I did quite a few months ago. There's a good mission in that to follow if you want to know a little more about the game. In the top right is my latest video, and in the bottom right, a video that YouTube has chosen from my channel just for you. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you all in the next video.